Hey everybody, it's Mike and you're watching The Real Black Podcast. Today we have the honor and privilege of having a dear friend on who has got her sophomore feature narrative out there on the streets. It's coming to Netflix this coming Friday. It's called The Perfect Fine. Don't you think it's time for you to get back at it? I'm gonna have to ask you to get out of my house. So what do I owe this pleasure? You stole every job I ever wanted. Now I call all the shots. I need a job. I may have a guy that I want to introduce you to. What, what you drink? Mocha latte. latte. Yeah, that's me. But I have oat milk because lactose intolerant. Ass is beatboxing. Yikes. <laughs> it's Numa Perrier. How you doing? Hi, I'm really good. I'm on a high right now. I'm feeling great. Okay, well, well tell me how does it feel then? You've been in the game for a while, but mm -hmm. this, this, is a, this is a lot going on because you're starring in movies that are Tribeca, you're, you're directing movies that are Tribeca, and now <laughs> you're in your Miami premiering Perfect Fine. So you're you're on the road with, with the Wades, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, I'm on the road after a long time of, you know, the opposite, so it feels really good. Uh, we had an incredible premiere at Tribeca in New York, which is where we film the movie, so that was very special for us to be there and have so many of our crew be able to come because they're local to New York, New Jersey area, you know, tri-state area. So that was great. And um, the movie was so well received. And that's always the most satisfying thing to feel like I got to do everything I wanted to do in the movie. And then it landed the way that I wanted it to land with a few surprises. Um, so yeah, it feels good. I did it for the culture. And so I feel like the culture is giving it back to me now. I love it. I love it. Um, well, I mean, talk, talk about that. I mean, I think, I think you have every right to, you know, be excited and proud. You did a great job Thank putting you. this movie together. It hits all the, the flavor notes of a great romantic comedy. <laughs> but then, you know, knowing you, I, I could see your, your personal touch on the film as well. I mm -hmm. mean, can, you, can you talk about how you navigate those things to, to have your voice come through this material? Yeah, well, it was, you know, it was a big opportunity presented to me, you know, to make a film that, you know, wasn't tied together by two shoestrings, like everything else I've done in my career to really have the support and the resources of the studio backing you. And, you know, the, the flip side of that is, okay, when a big studio is backing you, um, a big studio wants what they want, you know, and they wanted a big, bright, New York rom-com um, and they didn't want it to feel small and indie like all the things I've always done um, and so I'm always happy to rise to that occasion but them having that mandate actually helped me creatively to think bigger to know that I deserved more you know that I could ask for more that I could imagine more that you know, we could have a film that felt and looked as beautiful as I wanted it to look and that, you know, felt like the way I wanted to design my office that I don't have, you know, as I always wanted a pink conference room. So I'm going to give Darcy a pink conference room, you know, and I don't have to back down from that because we're able to, you know, turn this museum into an office, you know, into this extraordinary empire that um, Darcy is running this magazine. So to be able to have those resources, um, just got to let my imagination run more wild. So that's really what I'm really proud of and really excited about continuing doing. That's what more resources gives you. It gives you uh, broader horizons to reach to. Mm. Well, like like I said, there are flavor notes in there. They're very, I felt were distinctively yours, but I'm not, I can't <laughs> tell because there's so much going on. There's so many people, to correct, Tommy Oliver is a part of this film as well. Yeah. Who's, well, who's a it's a lot of, um, it's, you know, I wanted to make a great rom com that is a crowd pleaser, and I wanted to, people to know that it was my film at the same time. So okay. for me, a lot of things really aligned in terms of the story. In the story, 
uh, the lead character, Jenna, she loves vintage Black Hollywood. She loves these films. She loves these characters, these stars. Some of them I hadn't heard of, like Nina Mae McKinney. Um, I learned about her through reading the book, through reading the script, fell in love as well, the same as Jenna. And so I really was able to bring my love for that era into the film as well. But it was in perfect alignment with the story that was already there. So okay. it was just really, you know, the right meeting of <laughs> artist, director, and author, screenwriter. It was just the right meeting of all of us. So the journey, I mean, you know, like like I, I, I see every once in a while. And yeah. it's, it's one of those social media things. So whenever whenever I see you doing, whenever I see you, you're doing something big. Right? <laughs> well, that's then, social media, right? <laughs> Um, and I'm so proud of you. So Thank just you. to be clear, I'm so proud of you. Um, you know, but what's, what's the journey feel like for you to get to this moment? I know this is not your only moment, but I mean, just, just taking it, like, if we're just taking stock of June 16th, 2023, you know, what, yeah. what, what's the movement feel like and, and where do you feel like you are on your path? Yeah, I, I really feel you and I appreciate that because I know you've been there and I know you've seen the trajectory from my short films to building Black and Sexy TV. The community that was built there is so robust. Um, they support me so much to this day. I just came off of a panel where they really applauded that work. Um, and then to kind of, I kind of look at it as, well, I was part of this band and then I kind of went solo, but not but sort of not, but you know, <laughs> it's, right. you know, um, kind of the only analogy, great analogy I have for it. Um, but, you know, doing, making my first feature Jezebel was a big leap of faith for me. Um, and something that I felt was so necessary for me to introduce myself to the industry at large, that yes, I'm part of this collective and I'm part of this really beautiful community, um, really valuable community. And I'm also an artist who has a lot to say, <laughs> who has a lot that I'm trying to unpack about my life and my experiences. And I wanna do that through films. And so when I did that with Jezebel, it was kind of like making that announcement, like, yes, I've been part of all these things, but these are some very specific stories that I want to tell. These are, I want you to all to get to know me a little better. And so even moving into a studio feature now, I didn't want to lose sight of that. I still want people to feel like you're getting to know a little piece of Numa through this film. Um, my love for these incredible women who built this industry, you know, who are, you know, part of the bricks of this thing we call Hollywood and all of that's just really <laughs> important to me and to be here today sharing it. It's just a big emotional moment. I've had, you know, moments where I just kind of randomly burst into tears. Just feeling the accomplishment of it all is really setting in on me now and the perseverance that I've had um, and the support that I've had from so many people globally, really. Um, you know, people that tapped in on YouTube to things I was trying out. <laughs> So, mm. um, so yeah, it feels really incredible well, can, can to be here. For example, like what what is something that's in in your vision that 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 you that you had a, a seed for um, with Black and Sexy that you're able to grow bigger and have more people see in this new film, The Perfect Find? Like, well, I think that you know, I was really looking back on it and I said, oh, this is interesting. You know, my first film was this like kind of unconventional family drama. It was a love letter to sisters. It was my personal story it was really me stepping on the ledge and going, oh shit, like you guys are about to, you know, find out things that I deemed as secrets before and that, you know, that I had shame around. And, you know, that was a big leap. And, you know, making this rom-com is like a leap in the other direction. But it feels just as personal to me because I relate so much to Jenna's story. You know, in Jenna's story, she loses her job, she loses her man, <laughs> she crawls back to her mom, and then she has to like figure out the next thing. Um, and that literally happened to me, you know, <laughs> you know, through a series of unfortunate events, we'll call it. 
Um, mm -hmm. I really, really, really related to that. So I still feel like everything that I've done, you know, everything that I did at Black and Sexy TV was basically a rom-com. And I had mm -hmm. to realize that. I'm like, I've been in the rom-com space forever, you know, because that's really all about intimacy, Black intimacy, you know, um, how we laugh at things, how we use humor to get through things, um, you know, how things, how relationships are messy. That's very universal, of course. But yeah, it just, I feel like I've brought everything that I've ever done <laughs> to this moment right. and I'll continue to do that. But in terms of it being a rom-com, it kind of dawned on me one day that, oh, I've always been doing rom-coms. People always been laughing and aroused at everything that I right. do. It's like those two feelings go together. So, yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people are watching this, um, you know, and have followed your career. Also know that you're a mother. You're, you're, yeah. you're a proud parent. How do you, ba how do you balance work and, and personal life and, and motherhood and, and all that stuff? I mean, well, you know what? This week is interesting. I really miss my daughter. Um, you know, she was such a part of the filmmaking for Perfect Find and all of my filmmaking, really. She's been on set since she was five weeks old. I was breastfeeding her while we were making Rumi of her friends. I remember that so clearly. And I look back on those days and I'm like, wow, I didn't take a break at all. I didn't rest. There was like, you know, I was building, an, a, you know, a company and I just had her along for the ride and I got some really good advice from a friend of mine, actually, who's a single dad. I got some great advice from him a few years ago um, when I was getting ready to prepare to make this movie. And I knew that I was going to have to be away from L.A. for, you know, a good chunk of time. And he told me, whatever you can do try to just bring her with you. Now I've been bringing my kid to set, so this wasn't that foreign to me, but the way he kind of broke it down was like, if you're gonna be gone for an extended period of time, if you can, the thing that kids want the most is time. And I'm still not gonna have time because I'm gonna be on set, but the fact that I could still say hello to her in the morning or good night to her at night, depending on the schedule, but that we could have that, you know, touchstone daily um that made this the most unforgettable new york summer that she's still talking about that summer you know and i didn't see her a lot but i still saw her every day because i was able to figure out how to bring her with me so you know so that's i don't know i don't really know if you would categorize that as balance i had a lot of help from my friends um you know they came and they you know I flew them to New York and they would spend the day with her while I'd go film, but then I'd still see her at the end of the day. So, you know, that's kind of how I do it, but she's not here for the premiere. This movie's not appropriate for her and okay. I can't have her, you know, running around with me this week, but it feels a little weird because she was there the entire time that we were filming. Wonderful. Well, I know we are, we're on short time today. We'll have to do like a long masterclass. At some point. <laughs> We're going to break yeah. down I'm all, not, I, all oh, the things also, in the I film. Say, that wasn't advice. Uh, you know, that was advice that I got that I felt like would work for me. But I don't know. If, you know, it really depends on your kid if you can bring them <laughs> like that. <laughs> Understood. I want to be bringing, Understood. yeah. <laughs> but you, you got to work with my friend Godfrey. Oh, my God. You know, Godfrey, I love him. I've known Godfrey for 20 years. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah. he's the best. He's a great guy. He brought so much to the film. It was actually Gabrielle. Uh, Gabrielle's one of the producers on the film. And she had so many great casting ideas. And when we were trying to fill this role of Jimmy, you know, the guy that doesn't work out, um, you know, we're thinking about all different type of people. And she's like, well, what about Godfrey? I think he would be great. I wasn't familiar with him. I, I'm ashamed. Okay. I'm really ashamed that I wasn't familiar because I love stand-up comedy. I watch like every comedy special. I try to watch everything. It's really what got me through the pandemic. It's what gets me through a lot of things. But mm -hmm. um, so I discovered Godfrey and, you know, he came to set and he was just, he gave me so much respect, first of all. Anything I asked him to try, he would try. I tried to get to know him in a short period of time so I could kind of assess what I wanted him to do. And um, I knew he would improv because he's brilliant at that. But then I learned that he speaks Spanish. And I mm. said, you know what? You got to speak Spanish in the scene. I said, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> when 
shit starts getting tense and crazy, just start speaking Spanish and don't stop. Mm. And he took that, he ran with it. It's one of the funniest moments in the film. Yeah. And um, he's a real sweetheart. So I'm happy that he joined us. You know, it was a lot of fun. And, we're, I'm, and Gabrielle <laughs> Union's one of my favorite people. It's so good to see her just uh, just running things, you know. So, yeah. Well, how do you yeah. feel about her performance? Because this was a, a huge thing, you know, that we talked about how, you know, she's done, she's been in so many rom-coms. Um, and she wanted to walk away from this feeling like she contributed something different than she has before. And I feel like we nailed that, but what are your thoughts? Well, I, I feel like, you know, um, the character, it all comes from character and, and mm -hmm. what they have to overcome, right? So that's, that's yeah. the real thing. Um, I, I didn't look at it like that as much as I was like, okay, wow, Netflix is giving us what we got in spades and we didn't know we were being spoiled back in the nineties when JLo <laughs> was doing all these things and, and Gabrielle was definitely had her space and everything. So yeah. first, the first note that hit me was like, wow, it's like a blast from the past. And, and like you said, it's a big movie. I mean, you're using Nick, New York exteriors. Yeah. You don't, you don't get that very, very often nowadays. Yeah. So the production value right away hit me. And then the story, yeah, I mean, she's a woman of a certain age. Now, I feel old when she says, I feel old. And she's with this younger guy. Now, you know, that's, that's <laughs> well, what that's uh, when you feel the oldest, right? When you have the contrast, when your references are not lining up anymore. You know, I'll tell you a story about Keith Powers. Um, mm -hmm. So in the film, there's, uh, you know, we had to deal with rain a lot and mm -hmm. unexpected <laughs> rain pretty much on a daily basis. But we just, I said, you know what? It makes the movie more romantic. It makes it, it gives it more texture. Let's just find a way to shoot with the rain because we can't pause for it. Right. So the scene um, where he see where Keith's character sees Gabrielle's character with her ex and it's in the mm -hmm. rain. We were all singing that song. I oh, saw yeah, you and yeah, him yeah. walking in the rain, Orange Juice Jones, right? <laughs> and you got to be of a certain age to know that song and maybe of a certain culture too. But um, we were singing it and I said, I have to get that song in the movie. And because it's Netflix <laughs> uh -huh. and they were so generous with their music budget, they gave me every song I wanted. So mm. when that song hits, like with that, when that beat drops, for the um, audience, yeah. and you see that rain, you see the umbrella. It's the, you know the crowd goes wild for it. So, but that was a reference that Keith did not know. So I'm like, oh wow, yeah. this is really the generational divide right here. Because then later I had him say that lyric. I said, so I just whispered in his ear. I said, hey, the next time you do the next take, I want you to say to Gab, I saw you and him walking in the rain. And he was like, say it again. <laughs> He, he didn't, didn't know it. what I was talking about because he didn't know that that song was, that I was working to get no. that song in the movie, right? I said, just trust me, just say these exact words to her in the next take. I saw you and him, and him. walking and in the him. room. You have to say it exactly like that. And him. And we kept it in the movie. Because <laughs> no, when Gabriel didn't know it was going to happen. So when he okay. said it to her, it landed on her like she almost broke character completely. She had to keep it together. And you can see it if you look at that scene closely. Brian? I saw you and him walking in the rain. To stay away from my son. What world do you want? This one right here where I'm doing the work that I love with the man that I love. You can't have it both ways. I know a good thing when I see one. And I think you do too. 